I'm trying to get more into foreign cinema. We've done a lot of Korean based cinema recently. We've done some Russian, Stalker. You know what? And I thought we haven't done a French one yet. The Frenchies do produce some good That's cinema. We're a dick, but we did do La Haine. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I'm trying to do more French cinema. They do produce good content. And the way I went about this was I looked at the highest grossing French films ever. Mm. And the first two, I read the plot, was like, it's a bit too French for me. And then I came to to Intouchables, which at the time, at the time now, is the third grossing, highest grossing French film of all time. That fucking surprises me, to be mm. fair, because I, this does not seem like a higher grossing film. Like, if it wasn't for the fact that it had that remake that looked awful with Brian Cranston and that annoying little dwarf guy, <laughs> uh, what's his name, Kevin Hart? Kevin Hart. If it wasn't for that, I would never have heard of this film. And it feels like one of those sort of niche independent films that you only hear about if you go to France or you meet a French person and they tell you about, oh, you got to to see this because it's so good blah 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 I'm very surprised that it made that much money I think that one of the reasons is the guy who plays the paraplegic is a very well renowned French actor mm. so that drew in a lot of people to go and see it he's, 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 he's famous in French cinema but not really outside of it mm. so when I read the plot I do like uplifting films like this about you know disabled guy or you know different classes meeting together as well so I thought I'd give it a go so here we are like we take it in turns of whose film it is each week to uh, do a review on unless we get a, a viewer request and when it came through you said oh it's the untouchables and i googled it and the image came up and it was like this dude in a wheelchair and behind him this big happy black guy <laughs> like and i was like this looks shit and they were both kind of like wearing sweaters and it just yeah. looked all wholesome and i was like oh my heart sank i was like this looks shit and I was like, oh, fuck it. And I was actually putting off watching it. I only ended up watching it really late last night after Sophie had gone to bed. And I was I was just bemoaning having to watch it. I tried to, to save time. I tried to, I showed Sophie the trailer. And I was like, hey, maybe should we watch this as our film tonight? Not telling her that it was the film we had to review. And she was like, oh, that looks awful. I'm not in the mood for that. And I was like, fuck. So I was actually quite disgruntled and annoyed when I put it on at about midnight last night. And five minutes in, the opening is actually pretty cool. It actually caught me. You have essentially what is a high-speed chase. It's a classic Martin Scorsese with the Goodfellas opening to a film where you're seeing something that's actually taking place either in the middle or the end of the story, but they're showing it to you straight away to kind of entice you in and make you wonder how they got there. And it's just fun. Like it's just, You immediately get an insight into what their relationship's gonna be. Although, to be honest, the fact that the guy in the wheelchair now has a beard, which he doesn't support <laughs> for most of the film, confused me. I thought it was another character for a lot of it. But straight away, he's driving along this dude in the wheelchair in his fancy car, and they notice police behind him, and the black dude's just like, oh, shall I lose him? And they get into like this crazy high-speed chase with the police, and you're just like, what the fuck is going on here? I liked it. It was a very cool opening scene. It set up their relationship relationship it was really cool where it, it pans out what they were doing like they they would do that regularly and they bet each other obviously they bet each other they didn't lose them in the end basically they get caught and he acts like he's having a fit doesn't he so they're like shit and really good acting when he's like propping at the mouth we fucked it because obviously the guy from the projects the black guy we find out later he had brushes with the law so he couldn't stand police so for him to fuck them over and like mess about with them must have felt really good for him so so yeah, it was a really cool opening scene and I love it when the credits start rolling and you get that cool Earth, Wind and Fire song because they play quite a big part in the film like mm. later on Earth, Wind and Fire. So I thought, what an opening, man. It drew me in. It yeah, great. music in general. And then we get to the real opening of the film or the opening of the story anyway. And you see that this like mega rich, I would, like he's not a millionaire, I'd say he's probably, if not a billionaire in the hundreds of millions sort of region. Like it feels like he's extremely rich, probably old rich. I'm assuming based on where he's living feels like maybe like possibly an aristocrat or something you know he's he has like old famous paintings up on his wall and people with powdered wigs who was like <laughs> posing for a painting from like the 18th century who seemingly was his great great granddad so he's come from like, not just a line of money but also a line of upper class privilege whatever the fuck you want to call it all that horseshit and he's interviewing people to be his new carer because he is a paraplegic he has no feeling at all or control from his uh, neck down basically Stephen Hawkins so without the deteriorating muscles in the face as well 
it's a good scene as well because it starts off with them all waiting in the lobby like chatting to each other and i really like this because all the people look the same so it's all like white people it's racist yeah well, no sorry white people with like glasses and like well dressed and then it pans across and we see driss as like the odd one out it's just sitting there and you can really tell the well straight away because of the the corridor they're in and then you see like these you know the famous fabergé eggs and like you 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 quickly realize how how loaded he is so again a really good scene to set it up it does it well this film about each scene sets up more mm. and more um then we get to the interview declan so. so well he interviews the host of the other guys at first and it's the classic kind of montage cutting to different people being interviewed and then back to the original people and basically showing that they're all dicks and he doesn't like them and he's got this smoking hot secretary lady gorgeous redhead kind of like a french version of the redhead from mad men you know beautiful redhead big sloppy tits and just beautiful <laughs> curves and beautiful face lovely and just got a very sensual feminine way about her french basically driss comes in for his interview and he kind of slaps his thing on the table and says like i just need it signed so i can get my benefit to say that I actually showed up for the interview. And to be honest, I fucking hated it. I, really? thought, I thought he was a cunt. Being rude, incredibly arrogant, stealing from him, being incredibly rude to the sexy, you know, the woman I just spoke so respectfully about a second yeah. ago. But you know what I mean? I'm not in front of her and she's not a real person. You know, incredibly rude to everyone in the room. And I could see what it was going for. And obviously it's going to come around. But I was just like, I don't like this guy. I, I think he's a cunt. And maybe I was just, that was the mood I was in at the time going in the film. Maybe I was prepared to hate him. Yeah, I like the disconnect though of his interview compared to the others because mm. in the montage they all say the same things don't they they're like we've done it for interview you go into an interview and you know there's certain keywords that you'll say that will like team culture and mm. like values and like yeah. that 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 spikes them and they're like we just love disabled people we're very good at like paperwork one guy says i love cripples <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh, we're very um, we're very good at the red tape bureaucratic stuff so like do your finances and all that and then he turns up like bang i don't really give a shit about this just let me go and I, I did like that disconnect between mm. the two. Why do you think he gave him the job? Because Declan I think he gave him the job because he this could have been like his 20th carer 30th carer like I think with carers like that you're only with a patient for a certain amount unless you're with them your whole life and it, it changes obviously mm. and I think he was just so sick of having essentially the same people like clones essentially but different people who would be overbearing like he, he wanted some semblance of independence mm. and he, imagine if you was in a wheelchair Declan and this guy was just following you around like it's constantly like doing stuff for you and I think he saw it as I like this guy I like his humour he's something different and I want to give him a chance essentially yeah that makes sense I think part of it as well was him just being like ah fuck you I'm not gonna I'm gonna have a bit of power of you because you want your benefits I'm not gonna sign it oh, really? I'm gonna give you the job fuck face <laughs> yeah so I think it was probably a bit of that probably a bit of what I'm saying as well so you think do you think he wanted to give him a chance so he was like i'm from Cause no i i will maybe a little bit but my take i that makes as much sense as what i'm saying but my take at the time was the moment he was like i just want this sign for my benefits he was like no nah, you get the job then you have to actually work because within their conversation in the interview um he asked him like where you're from and he says like the name of the project and the guy in the chair is like oh that's the name of a famous french architect or something mm. and then Drew's is like no it's an area it's like the, the projects and they start building up that humor so i thought that he might know because he doesn't seem like a stupid guy the rich guy really does he i think not at all i think he might he was like i know that area is basically a shithole so i can provide you like a place in my mansion and fuck it why not kind of thing yeah maybe even just as a little social experiment for his own fucking Understand? pleasure yeah I definitely don't think he's an idiot. I also do think he's kind of a bit deluded with his pretenses and that comes up later in the film. But Driss comes back the following morning thinking he's collecting his signed document so that he can collect his benefits. In the interim, we see a bit of his home life where he's living at home with what seems like a back of a lorry worse full of immigrants to France mm. where he's, you know, he's he seems to be sisters and brothers and, and aunties and uncles and maybe his mum and dad, but we're not quite sure. And we find out later that 
that he was actually brought over by his auntie and uncle basically given away by his parents on account of his auntie and uncle couldn't have children which must have been traumatizing then they brought him over to france and then suddenly magically could have children so produced about seemingly like 10 of them there's so many kids running about the place so it's quite an unusual family dynamic and it hammers home just how difficult the living conditions are how strained they are seems like there's a lot of love in the family but also you know they're in a shitty area the brothers he's into crime here and there all his his younger brother who's coming of age is getting into crime you know he's trying to have a bath but not enough warm water and all his brothers and sisters are coming in and brushing teeth and there's no privacy but hammers home the difference between this life and the life that old uh, Richie Rich is living yeah yeah I was wondering like when he said he'd give him the job like I was thinking is he gonna turn up but I realised he did at the end like Mm. but it must have been a difficult decision in a way like he's used to like running around scraping money together how he can and now he's got to like go and care for this like random rich guy like it, like his thought process must have been like mm, what the fuck <laughs> it must have been what the fuck but also it was made very easy because when he comes the next day expecting to get his just signed papers so he can collect his benefits he instead is getting a tour of the entire place and being told of what duties he'll be doing and once he sees where he'll be living or sleeping at least his bedroom which is probably about five times the size of his entire family's home mm. and sees like the absolute lavish furnishing and huge big windows the bed is probably the size of his room back at home and he's just won over instantly and he's like let's fucking do it i love this scene because he goes around the room and then he goes in the bathroom and he sees like this massive bath and he gets so excited he's like well i've got a bath and i just thought that was perfect because in a previous scene we saw him like all cramped up in his little bath compared to this like jacuzzi type tub and like it was such just a nice scene like to just get excited about a bath because we take that for granted don't we but like for people that come from like poverty it must be amazing like do you mm. know what I mean well I don't have a bath so I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like I have one at, I have one at home I don't but I don't use I it I just have a lowly shower <laughs> yeah, unfortunately yeah, yeah. I'm buying into the film at this point in the sense of like okay I like the fact that he's 100% hunk of shit and is just purely doing it for selfish you know the old Richie Rich in the wheelchair there's been no little dialogue between him and his secretary saying oh if only someone gave him an opportunity mm. to help. he's more just like playing games as well so I'm kind of digging that angle of it of the reasoning of how they're setting this up because I'm not going to lie I fucking hate any film where it's like two classes meet or yeah. a white guy meets a black guy and you know the black guy teaches the white guy how to dance and have fun and the white guy teaches him how to read Yeah, yeah, yeah. all those sort of films I fucking hate so I'm not going to lie I was prepared on a couple of different levels to not like this film so by this point are you starting to enjoy no, by the, it or by this point it was no longer a struggle to focus okay cool i was getting engaged we're gonna have to keep stopping at certain points and i'm gonna have to get where you're at okay, in, yeah. in your psyche so you're getting into it a little bit <laughs> getting into it a little bit once he's had the tour of house we see him get down to work so he's given a crash course training of, of caring for stephen hawkins and mm. <laughs> so uh, and this is quite a funny scene because there's another like lady carer who obviously knows everything who's like training him you know like lift him up it, this bit's funny because like driss just lifts him up like a rag doll mm. like, he's a big fucker isn't he like puts him in the chair and then like turns his back and he like slips down and they're like no don't don't fucking move about like putting his seat and it's just this really drives home like the amount of work and concentration it would take to be a carer you have to be Mm. constantly on the ball you can't take your eye off anything well also what an odd like when it's as intense as this where it's kind of essentially 24 hour or they say it in various ways throughout the film you're my arms and legs Mm. and it's such a strange concept because he really is like anytime he wants a bite of food or he wants a bit of water he has to ask for it and someone else has to do it someone else has to do virtually everything everything for him it's it's spread out between various people at various times but night 9% 9% of the time once he's his carer it is Driss and that's such an odd relationship and such an odd power dynamic as well I suppose how do you not get close unless you completely resent each other Driss he says I'm not wiping the ass of a guy I just met maybe if I knew him a bit better but you know I'm not wiping the ass of a stranger I've you know just met mm. so it is such a bizarre intimate thing and to allow someone else to do that must be horrendous I suppose he has no choice but you know it's interesting because I, I you know I've got into I get obsessed with different YouTube channels at different times 
and I was quite into, for a month or two, interabled relationship oh, YouTube it. channels. It is a fascinating thing where you see, you know, even more intensely you know, a relationship, etc. relationship, you know, love and relationship, whatever, where they're the, also the carer. And I suppose in certain ways, if, if it's not a resentful thing, it's probably even more intimate, I guess, in a way. But at the same time, it's like you're wiping their ass and stuff as well. Like, it's not just like the superficial things you might see. But back to that point of inter... I was about to say interracial. <laughs> inter able relationship it's like when i see stuff like that being human nature i always have the first two questions it's like mm. when i get into a cab like i get in and my head's like don't say it don't say it you had a busy night mate like and it's like can they fuck like is the first oh, okay. question or is there an ulterior motive does that person in a wheelchair have money or like mm. they're trying to get to the money and i thought like about this film like is he trying to like care for him like i've seen programs where they pretend to care for him and get written in their will and like shit yeah, like no, that. I'm sure. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that does happen, but it also is clearly with many of them, probably, I assume, most of them genuine. And one thing I find funny is that one of the ulterior motives that you see people accusing them, often these interabled relationships in the comment sections, is uh, they probably just have a fetish. And yeah. that's also something that usually they tend to get very defensive about. But my thing is, is what, like, what's, what's wrong with having a fetish? What's wrong mm-hmm. with if it is a fetish? Why do they have to love the person in in spite of that thing yeah, yeah why can't they also be attracted to it isn't that nicer isn't that mm. like in a way nice that literally there's someone you literally as in a sense met your soulmate because you met the person that actually is even sexually attracted to this unique way you have whether you i don't know you're in a wheelchair or you have cerebral palsy or whatever like whatever condition you have literally you've met someone that actually naturally finds that sexy and beautiful and then falls in love with you why is that a bad thing surely that's a great thing yeah no i agree with you but there's some fetishes that just bear weird like like men dress up as like babies with diapers on and shit and like weird <laughs> Do you know what weird but at That's the end weird. of the day the whole you know, sex in general is weird you're like you're fucking a, a, a soggy bit of tissue gets hard from blood in it and then yeah. you shove it into someone else's hole and you fucking pump till a bunch of jizz comes out like the whole thing's fucking weird like why is that any weird it is weird and like, uh, do you know what I mean like the worst one and we're gonna I think we should review it on this very program Sorry. is the guys the men that love cars That's <laughs> like, literally they be driving along and like see an old car and be like oh <laughs> do you know what yeah we'll, we'll um, do an episode on that because that is legendary back to um the untouchables so we just see these next scenes really are like the building of their relationship so they start going around and doing stuff and and finally getting out of the confines of the mansion like mm. i love the scene <laughs> he's loading him into like what i would call as what we would call here as the star bus like you know right. you know like that that thing and he's like look i have to use use this because i have to like i'm in a wheelchair i need to, like the wheelchair to be loaded in and he pulls off the little cover and there's a fucking maserati yeah and he's like no nah, we're using this and they, they get in he's, he's like doing donuts and the fucking the care of the estates like fuck's sake tutting like running about and the gates open i love this scene and the guy is parked in front on the phone and he's like oh it's my neighbor he always blocks me and then driz goes mad then he gets out grabs the guy puts his face up against it read the sign and like i I like that because it showed that you could see that he is starting to like care for Philippe mm. in the, the wheelchair. So it's a really see, maybe nice I'm scene. just being a moany old man, but I fucking that's just there's moments like that where I kind of hated him. Maybe I'm just taking the film yeah, too seriously. Enough. But it is feels like a grounded film. And I was just like... Like, I think part of this was the fact that I'd drunk a load of whiskey and was getting all grumpy and <laughs> it was late and I didn't want to watch the film in the first place. But I was, at the same time, buying into it. But it's just it's like you're just attacking a random geezer. No, I get that. I, like I don't know. I just didn't... It didn't hit me in the moment like that. Yeah. The way I knew the film wanted it to hit me. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. I like these things where they'd go around and do the stuff that Philippe would do mm. that Driz would never like dream of doing it. So we see him go to what's clearly like a private viewing of an art gallery. It's a really cool scene because when he's looking at a painting, you see the Eiffel Tower through mm. the window. I thought that was very nice. And they're looking at this piece of art, which I can only describe as white canvas with a blood stain on it. It should have been. It's like basically, you know, when you accidentally open one of those bins in a public toilet. Oh, yeah. and there's certain things that ladies use in there oh yeah yeah basically imagine that in art form that is what it is it's just a blob of red Drizz is like this is shit basically like and let's be honest second, it is shit this like, is where I love Drizz for the first time when <laughs> he's just sitting in the back with his feet up M&M's throwing M&M's back 
And it was the first time, probably, the reason why I loved him for the first time was the first time I was actually aligned with him on something. Where I was watching him just look at this and just be like, what the fuck are you talking like? And it must be infuriating for him as well, coming from the life he comes from. Seeing this pretentious douchebag in a wheelchair who he's not really bonded with properly yet. I know he had that moment with the guy who was parked outside, but you know, he's, he's still just getting to know him. And he's still probably just like, doesn't care. Mm. And he's just watching him blow 41,000 euros on this piece of shit, this meaningless piece of canvas. Yeah, he says, like, they says, how much is it? And she says, like, 30. And then he's like, fucking hell. And then she comes back and, like, I made a mistake. It's 11,000 more. It's obviously, we know he's rich. We've seen it. But he just must have, like, disposable income. Because, like, mm. if you're going to spend that amount of money, you could get something a lot better than that painting. That's just fucking useless. But what I did like is the real culture disconnect of, of Driz just scratching his head. Is this what mm. the other half do? Do you know what I mean? So, And I like that theme getting hammered home subtly in moments like this where it was just natural interactions there was times when it was direct exchanges between the characters dialogue between the characters where it was really just kind of like oh this is a bit shoehorned in and rubbish mm. like when they were discussing music you know there's a scene later where it's the rich guy's birthday and he's got this whole big orchestra in and they're doing, he's just you know being like do Mozart's seventh symphony or whatever the fuck and you see Driss is kind of like oh this isn't too bad I recognise this from that car advert yeah. and, and then he's like okay you've had your music let me do my music and he starts playing Earth Wind and Fire and it is fun when they're all dancing Yeah. but it's a bit like this is fucking corny man this is corny white and black people bonding shit yeah I, I, I get what you're saying it was pretty funny though when he heard one he was like I know this it's from the benefits line <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I, did good, like yeah. <laughs> I did like that because the whole music on certain stuff is like terrible uh, to be fair like my it one at work's really cool like it's proper like really nice tune some of them you can tell are playing like horrible music with a bad signal yeah to try and get you to hang yeah, up yeah yeah it's like they're it's like they're playing it off a cassette and they got a phone to the cassette yeah. and it's like so distant it's like in Through a, a thunderstorm <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you just yeah. can't quite it's hear like... it properly <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um i never hang up no man i refuse to hang up i'll be on the phone like hmrc is the worst i'll be on for like four hours and mm. like, i will not be beaten by this system like do you know what i mean um but in between this i like the kind of we we get to see philippe's daughter mm. and i like these scenes because drizz is a little cutie wasn't she uh she was a bit of a bitch but, oh, but she was yeah, yeah i like i've got a thing for french girls yeah yeah, yeah, yeah but it's funny because the scene we get introduced to them drizz is like it's one of his first days and i think maybe he's the end of his first day and he snuck off to the room to like just eat a sandwich and mm. have a six pack of beer and we see the daughter outside with her <laughs> with her boyfriend and they're like oh she just throws away to the boyfriend oh that's my dad's new helper like fucking whatever like and then she's like where can we get some beer you've taken it all and like he starts cussing the boyfriend calling him moped because <laughs> he has like this really like and like straight away i could see that they there'll be some friction between the mm. two of them because she is very very stuck up obviously the dad i it seems hasn't really disciplined her yeah and there's a scene later where she bursts into Driss's bedroom and is being really rude to him making fun of him when he goes to throw her out he's you know she's like if you touch me I'll say you hit me and blah 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 whatever doing that old routine so he's like fuck this so he goes into a Will's his little office and he says literally if she doesn't straighten out I'll annihilate her which was a bit like I think I'd throw this geezer out at this point if he was threatening to yeah. beat up my daughter yeah. but he knows that he has a point his daughter is a little spoiled bitch and he knows it's his fault he's struggled since the death of his wife to properly be the father that's disciplined so he's there for her he loves his daughter but he nearly has trouble i think disciplining her because of the fact that you know he knows what she's gone through with the death of his mother we find out that she's died of a terminal illness also she's gone through the fact that her dad has become paralyzed because mm. he wasn't always like this it was during a paragliding accident we discover we also have seen driss steals one of the Fabergé eggs that's just lying around he doesn't know what the fuck it is it's just an egg with gold on it and he's like what the fuck's this so he steals it gives it to one of his siblings as a little present but we find out that as they're becoming closer driss is talking to rich rich and he's saying you know my wife she used to give me a Fabergé egg for every year that we were together and you see driss is getting a bit guilty looking and then out of nowhere he says so return it he doesn't make a big deal of it he doesn't even say like bring it back to me and present it to he's just like just put it back 
back in the film. Yeah, and we'll and there's, he doesn't say it, but there's a clear and we'll say no more about it vibe. Back to the Father J egg, he brings it back to his. I'm gonna call it a flat because I guess mm. that is what it is, and it's, we think it's his mum, but we find out later it's his auntie, isn't it? And he's been he just returns home out of nowhere, and they have this whole argument where the auntie's like, "No, get out. We don't want you around here," because it turns out that he's just done a stretch in prison. Mm. We find that out later, and you've just come back and presented me with a Kinder egg, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which I which I found quite funny. So we're, we're we're starting to get a bit of his background here. Like I kind of knew from the first interview that he was a bit of a shady character mm. but you got a flip side of it where the people around Philippe are beginning to worry like why have they picked this guy as the carer what is his mm. motives someone is sent to have a conversation with Philippe but it seems like his lawyer he says look I've got access to files for my job I've looked into this Driz guy he's got a long rap sheet he's been in prison for jewellery theft he's been in prison for various stuff like we're worried about you we're, why have you picked this guy it's not like he's the most qualified it's not like he's good at his job and then Philippe comes out and says because he he allows me to be independent he forgets what I am where I am like sometimes when I get a phone call he'd even hand me the phone because mm. he'll forget that I can't use my arm and his leg and for Philippe like he finds the whole thing I think Declan refreshing mm. like as I said before these like clone nerd guys they're like constantly all around him and you know they're not doing the stuff that they're doing like you see them in the park racing each other doing fun stuff and and later on, like reading into this, all this stuff actually happens as we find out later. Yeah, it is a true story. The, the real, yeah. the real Driz. We'll get into it at the end. Not a giant black guy though. He's like this it, little Moroccan guy. He's Algerian. Guy. Yeah, Algerian. Yeah. He actually, the real Driz. I was reading facts about this. He actually installed a, a wheelchair a engine in the wheelchair to make it go much, much faster. <laughs> Why the fuck didn't they put that in the uh, film? No, so they could actually like race each other. Really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was really cool, man. With Driz, he's doing a lot of stuff that the really boring carer wouldn't be able to do like we see Philippe is you know in bed like they communicate for a baby monitor and mm. he gets these phantom pains which is what paraplegic people get where your whole body burns I guess and then Driz I knew this was going to happen by the way he was like is there not any way that we could sort this out and then the great plant itself <laughs> our friend Mary Jane makes an appearance is anything for pain or anything our friend marijuana so they start bunning up like, like <laughs> <laughs> they're literally watching the like the little con <laughs> like smoking yeah, a fat like cone that. and I liked do you know all these little things like I really like the theatre scene as well mm, I was like, just about to say you, that oh, yeah. you, you take no, the no, you, so you I've been talking for, for ages no, you go for it, um, no. they go to the theatre and I've been to the theatre a few times or oh, it's even worse the opera the opera sorry I've been to an opera where my dad like you know like dads will sometimes be like even though like I'm a builder some from North London so I want to go and see the opera to like get that yeah, other yeah. side exactly so, I do it once so yeah exactly really. like like Drizzy is in and like a bush is singing and he's got a point like it's a fucking tree like, he's just tracking it. <laughs> and, and the rest of them were like shh 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 like and I just really I, I just really like enjoyed it because let's be honest who wants to see the theatre for fuck's sake opera like no one <laughs> see I wouldn't put it as much in the column of like the, the, the art at the start and the pretense around like seeing a blob of shit on a canvas and being like well what does this mean mm. and don't get me wrong when I like I'm not dismissing all art I remember when I was young going to a museum for a school trip and it was a, one of these huge canvases from like I don't know like the 15 century or something and it was a big religious painting probably right. the size of my entire wall of my flat national gallery huge and it had not only was it like the technical level involved just looked uh, mind-blowing but also the person doing the tour was giving us this whole long like explanation of everything that was going on because it was like a bunch of people and there was this story and there was these you know different hidden meanings going on in different parts of the painting my little 10 year old dumb brain was blown like I was like wow this is amazing I'm not talking about dismissing art like that but yeah. when it's this modern an art horseshit yeah. I'm like fuck that and I it'll be like us we go like our opera would be like going to the cinema to see Oppenheimer the new mm. Christopher Nolan film rich elitist people's cinema will be the opera like mm. written by Moses however long ago like this is our opera you know what I mean and I get what you're saying about modern art like I saw like loads of renaissance paintings by Dutch of like Jesus Christ and 
and stuff. And then the next thing, I, I go along to the Tate Modern, and they'd be like, this is a corrugated piece mm. of iron, like, twisted together. And I'm like, well, what the fuck? With a salmon thrown <laughs> yeah, on top. Yeah, yeah. It'd be like... that. Pay us 500,000. Yeah, it'd be like that Tracy Emin, this is my bed sheets, and, like, it'll be sewn in, like, a piece of, like, semen yeah. from her boyfriend. I'm like, what the fuck is yeah. this? Like, I took a shit <laughs> yeah, on a lamppost. Yeah. <laughs> and it'll be like that Damon, <laughs> her, here's a lamb, like, with fucking... Oh, yeah, but I get what you mean. Yeah, like, it's horseshit. But um, we see their relationship evolve. They're getting more and more into, mm. like, personal stuff, where we find out Philippe has been writing letters to mysterious yeah. lover. We, we we hear it on the baby monitor, and the, the, the other woman, like, turns it off. This is private. Next thing you see, Driss, like, burst in, like, you're writing all these horseshit letters, but you've never spoken to her on the phone, so he just bells her up, and then they start speaking. And, and we, Philippe is incredibly nervous. apprehensive yeah. and doesn't want to do it, but he's pushed into it by Driss. I like this because, you know Philippe obviously being paralysed or paraplegic sorry he's nervous like he hasn't had a relationship since his wife has passed mm-hmm. away to add on to that he's now in a wheelchair Declan so mm-hmm. it is very nerve wracking yeah. for him and Driz says to him look you've been writing poems and horseshit letters for like months and months she likes you man and then you get the whole thing of Philippe being like but does she only like me for my bank balance and I really like that mm-hmm. it must be like hard for him so we, we see that evolve a bit later on and and Philippe is a real romantic to the point of like it's excruciating like some of the horse shit that he's reciting in these letters it's just complete nonsense but she's swallowing it up she seems to love it there's a great conversation where he Driss is like very not tactfully asking him if his dick still works basically mm-hmm. and he, he says no obviously I have no feeling you know we know this especially because Driss at one point boy pours Boy's hot tea on his leg because he's so fascinated at the fact <laughs> that he can't feel anything he's, he's asking him you know like oh so your dick doesn't work so what, do, what would you do like how do you get off or how do you get with a woman and he's talking about how he really likes his ears but yeah touched. that's he, so funny man he gets horny from his ears getting stroked but it's like later on we see him like posting a mm. photo i don't know like these fucking the geezers rich and they're like doing like victorian stuff like mm. <laughs> yeah. he posts a photo and i like this scene because yeah. he's got the two photos he got him like leaned on a bar like or him in a wheelchair he looks pretty suave in the wheelchair yeah he has like a hot old like scarf. they do a little montage yeah, uh, yeah. trying on different outfits yeah. uh, classic montage and he chooses to send the, the able-bodied photo which mm. i thought like perfectly summed up he's still not very accepting yeah, yeah. That, that is also a, a moment where my engagement in the film went up another level again because I was like I like the fact that Driss was just like no send the one where you're in a wheelchair fuck it mm. and that moment where he couldn't do it is made me really sad and then we get to the date night and Driss is off doing his own thing you know he's driving about in the Maserati enjoying himself Philippe is at the restaurant with his other carer and he's clearly getting really nervous he starts ordering mm. double whiskeys before mm. she's getting there and he bottles it and he's just like no nah, we're going up. and you see him getting pushed out in the wheelchair at the same time as his date is walking in and she doesn't even notice him you realize like obviously part of the name is probably the fact that you know obviously Philippe is an intouchable in the sense that you know he's this guy in a wheelchair that no one ever notices and no one ever thinks can do anything and no one ever wants to give any uh, independence to or time to and Driss is you know a guy from a part of the city that no one gives a fuck about and a person that's just gonna you know c- grow up maybe get into crime maybe get a menial job maybe be one of the very rare rare ones who actually makes it out and does something with their life but you know don't get any opportunities don't get seen don't get talked about don't get publicized don't get any representation in the media and is an intouchable in the same sort of way i guess i I assume that's kind of like the what they were going for to an extent but it's just such a sad human moment where you really get inside philippe's head i'm going to talk about my personal experiences Mm. now viewers i'm sitting down here you (laughs) you won't know you won't know nothing about me but i have mild cerebral palsy um i won't go into what it's a it's a disability that affects my walking from being born early oxygen being cut up to my brain if you want to google it you can that's up to you but dating i totally sympathize mm. maybe i sympathize with this film maybe i got into it a lot more because of yeah, having a disability definitely. myself that can i could touch on some of the stuff and the dating totally resonated with this mm. because when i first started dating i didn't say anything about my cerebral palsy 
quality and it made the first few dates terrible because mm, I'd yeah. be on edge all the time like I can tell you the first day I met a girl at a pub and I was like trying not to get up I really needed to piss but I didn't want to yeah. get up because she'd see the way I walked like I was worried if she's going to be like do you walk do you have a limp like so that ruined it now on my dating profiles I'm very open and say I have cerebral palsy disability affects my walking if you want to ask any questions please do um, and then often people will match with me and say oh so what is cerebral like they won't google it but they ask questions about it and from the get go I'm honest and then I know that anyone I match with is comfortable with my disability and that makes everything I don't have to go then Declan and explain anything about it that's mm. off the table we've already done that so then it's just not about my disability it's about me and my personality so I, I sympathise with Philippe man and mm. I wish he could have said it from the outset like, yeah, yeah but it's totally understandable yeah. as well like fucking hell he meets up with Driss and they go to a private plane mm. and they're flying and Driss is scared of flying clearly and Philippe keeps fucking with him anytime there's a noise he's like oh I think one of the engines <laughs> just fell off and he's like freaking out and then they they land in maybe Switzerland or something but you realise oh it's the site obviously where he originally had his paragliding crash they decide to go paragliding again the two of them getting Driz because Driz doesn't want to do it number mm. one getting Driz out of his comfort zone which probably he's been doing for most of the whole movie mm. caring for Philippe so it's a real full circle thing mm. and also it's Philippe going back to the scene of where it happened and like doing it again mm. because like would you want to paraglide again if you've been <laughs> paraplegic I suppose you're getting a sense of closure and you know when he first tells Driz about his accident he says I only fly in my dreams now yeah but now you know he's flying again so there's you know it's, it's kind of in a poetic sense it's it's a beautiful moment for the character and also Declan he can get the some of the sensation of it because remember he's paralysed from the neck down but the mm. rush of the wind in his face like the whole looking like above like it must still be good mm. for him it must be a thrill oh yeah so absolutely 100% it was a very very nice scene did it break your stone cold heart <laughs> or was you just uh, down in whiskey I, smoking I, cigarettes that <laughs> scum <laughs> it was it was already pretty broken once um, yeah. when he, he bottled his date so oh, okay. I was already oh. right in there so let me ask you something because I didn't quite understand it at the time maybe yeah. there's no more real maybe there's nothing else to get but why does Driss leave the job I think they come to um, realisation between Driz and Philippe. They both kind of say, like, Philippe says to Driz, look, let's be honest about it. Let's just end it. It's nothing, let's get out of the way. It's nothing to do with him stealing the Faberge egg or anything like that. They've passed mm. that. He's, he, as you said, he just said, give it back. I don't care. He just says, look, you don't want to be just caring for me for the rest of your life. Like, I think it was more of a mutual understanding where, you know, I don't think, even though Driz done an okay job and they had bonded together, it wasn't his, he wasn't like a natural carer kind of thing. Like, do you mm. know what I mean? Like some other people would be. And like, he wasn't the best carer. Like, even though he tried, he wasn't the most skilled. So they just both came to the understanding of, we've come to the end of this arrangement. Mm. You need to do other things. I need probably someone else because for you, it's not your life ambition. So mm. it just comes to an end. Yeah, it's quite a sad moment, but it's quite a nice moment as well. And you you see Driss goes off into the world and for a minute he's going to try and get benefits again but you see he just doesn't want to live mm. like that anymore and he, he ends up getting a job as a driver and you know there's a nice moment in the interview where he's talking to the girl and chatting her up I'm assuming he starts shagging her he starts talking about oh you like Dali you like the art on the wall because he knows about art a bit now we even see while he's staying with Philippe he, he actually starts trying out art and starts painting mm. in his room mm. and, and Philippe is so enamoured with the fact that he's actually started painting he takes one of his like you know again it's a canvas with a load of shite on it and he, he takes it to one of his dealers but doesn't obviously say who's done it who's yeah. the artist and ends up getting 11,000 euros yeah. for it which shows what a load of shit is mm. but at the same time it's such a nice moment for their two characters you see the fact that he has grown as a person and learnt some things and his world's been opened up for the better so they go off and do their own thing for a bit and then Philippe's not doing very well is he he's become mm. all dishevelled and like all ill the, the care he's got in he has essentially is like he seems to go through a lot of them actually. he seems to go over a lot of carers and they're not giving him the same kind of relationship that he had with Driz because they're being too in a way being too overburdening not giving him that extra space that he wants treating him like a child yeah yeah and um ends up the the lady of the manor I'm gonna call her ends up calling Driz back and saying look can you come back Cause he's, well she calls him back specifically because he's having one of his phantom yeah, pains phantom, episodes phantom 
phantom fits. And Driz seems to be the only person that can t- get him out of it and knows how to settle him down. Because when you're, he describes it as like your entire body being on hot coals, yeah, yeah, but you yeah. can't do anything about it. It sounds excruciating. You know, the other guy, the other helpers are trying to help, like when he is having it, but Philippe's like, fuck off, like, mm. I'm not having it. So that really shows in that scene that the, the bond they built for him to go back. I like this scene yeah. as well. Then we kind of fast forward. Well, hold up, what about when he's shaving his beard off? Cause oh, he's, I love He's this. cracking up at his beard. He's like, oh, I don't know about this beard, man. You look like oh, a hobo. Oh, this scene's excellent. Like, so he does it like mutton chops and then he does it with like just the Hitler beard. <laughs> the Hitler <laughs> tash. He's like... And, the funny and he's thing, raising his little limp arm yeah, yeah. up like that. Like, the funny oh, thing is like, Philippe's getting pissed off like, no, nah, stop messing about because Philippe can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> he, he can't like raise his arms like, no, stop, stop, stop. So that was a really funny scene. Like, I like that. That is brilliant. And then we get to the really, really good, good final, final scene where Driz takes him out and then the whole time Philippe's like what are we doing like because again it's funny Declan because he can't do anything <laughs> he has to like go wherever Ooh. he's taken so he like takes him to a really nice restaurant like overlooking the sea and then Driz is like it's not me you're having dinner with I'm leaving and he like leaves and he's like shouting Driz 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 and then you're wondering what is going on but you can kind of work it out yeah. really you can, yeah. and then the lady he's been writing letters to we finally get the full circle lovely moment where he didn't have the confidence before to do it but he was adamant he wanted to leave and he was taken out this time Driz is having none of it mm. he will do this date and he will go through with it and it's such a really nice ending because throughout the whole thing Philippe's been very vocal about he, he cares for me but he doesn't over care for me he allows my space mm. he allows me he forgets about my disability sometimes and this is the real like full circle of their relationship where he's like no you're gonna do this I'm gone like do you know what I mean mm. we see him walk off into the distance and we see the lady come in and she looks lovely by she's the way. gorgeous yeah, yeah 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 and it's nice as well because you can see on you can see on Driss's face is you know when when they departed ways his life was so much for the better for mm. having known him and Philippe's wasn't it wasn't like he wasn't doing well without him because he hadn't actually really taken any of the lessons on board properly or he at least hadn't followed through with them it was wonderful seeing Driss's face as he He's looking through the window laughing as you know he sees the date walking in mm. because it's clear like he really he wanted to repay the favor like he really wanted to do it for his friend and help him out and it's just a nice moment it's just it's just a lovely way to end the film and then we get the real the real nice bit so we get some tech flash across the screen that um philippe is now married with like two kids i assume to mm. that lady mm. so it worked out and living it, in morocco as well yeah living in morocco and driz the real Driz, by the way, uh, owns his own company now and he's successful. Mm. And then we see it transitions into a photo of the real two people. Mm. It's Philippe in his wheelchair and Driz, who's Algerian and not Senegalese. Yeah. The, by the way, he's made Senegalese because the directors of this film, they saw it on a documentary. They're, the real yeah. two people's relationship was like, this would make a good film. And they'd worked with Omar Sly, who's the black guy, yeah. in a previous film. So yeah. they wanted to change Very good actor, actually. They really liked he, him. Didn't he go to Netflix to be like that Papillon or whatever it was. No idea. But anyway, he got famous. So they wanted to work with him, so they changed it up. The, the premise was still the same. The rest mm. was how it played out. But we see the real Driz, Algerian Driz, and Philippe on the cliff, overlooking the cliff where uh, he had his paraglider. Oh, is that where that was? Wow. So it's a real, like, really touching moment. And, you know, the film just ends. So I'm going to ask you, because I picked mm. the film, Declan, so I wanted to watch this. This is the way the reviews work. You have to do it. Uh, Sorry, Declan. <laughs> you started out with a bit of a heavy heart and drunk on whiskey and sad and, you know, did it... Tra- oh, Saturday nights. So yeah, did it Did it change throughout the film? I can understand why you wouldn't have liked it. Absolutely, absolutely. I went in not being into it. Got more drawn in, uh, but I still went through levels. There was, There's still bits even up towards the end that I just found corny and didn't like and a bit too like, hey, the black guy shows us cool music mm-hmm. and, and he's like, hey, what about painting and there's more to life and all that shit but as as those films go this is a fucking stupendous one and it's it's well executed but it's also quite subtle it's believable how they become friends it's organic it's not all nicey nice it is a grounded version of these films it's still one of those films but you know I'm a sucker for an uplifting film and I'm a sucker for these kind of simple films where they're not pretentious and they're not trying to be overly different they're nearly just giving you a tried and test formula 
once again but in a slightly different way it helps that the performance is all really good the directing is all really good it's re everything's very well executed there's so many times where i want to hate a film from the get-go and within five minutes the characters have just drawn me in and i'm rooting for everyone so i definitely recommend this film i thoroughly enjoyed it i like films where people with disabilities like go on to have like a great life and it helps a lot mm. declan that it's based on a true story because if this was just a, a script where it wasn't i'd be like this is annoying and mm. this would never happen so yeah. <laughs> it is great and obviously it had a huge impact omar sly went on to big big things he was in that netflix thing became very famous the directors were saying that after they'd done the film they got over three thousand letters from wheelchair users oh, thanking really? them and obviously it must have been good declan because hollywood saw it and thought let's make a shit remake american yeah. remake of it so all in all i highly recommend it um it, it's not one of those cor it is corny in elements but it's very good in the way that it does it it shows harsh realities as well so i would recommend it on that premise of having a disability all oh, right there you go from the horse's mouth <laughs> yeah from the horse's legs <laughs> from the spaghetti legs <laughs> Says, baby, ah, ah.